This video is looking at R.C. Sherriff's play Journey's End and really the way of using this is to sit with a copy of the text and to be annotating it and thinking about it and adding your own ideas as we're working through the text. Obviously the next stage if you're studying the text for an exam or for an assessment would be to start grouping the ideas together. So to start making quotation banks for different characters and different themes drawn from what you're thinking as we go through the text chronologically. So looking at this then, you can see that we have, before the action starts, um, Sheriff setting the scene, and he's very particular in saying that this um, play is set in the couple of days before um, the San Quentin attack. Now that was um, a, a historical event. It was known as Operation Michael, um, the German attack on St. Qu uh, Quentin. And it was basically that a German general decided that he really needed to um, get a grip of, of what was going on before the Americans started to arrive. So he decided that he was going to attack the British forces um, at St. Quentin, which was the old site of the Somme kind of battlefields. So psychologically and, and physically, um, he believed that there would be an advantage. What it meant was that the British were predicting this, this attack. And so you've got all the way through the text, creating tension, heightening the kind of drama and sense of um, impending doom, if you like, sense of futility. You've got the idea that, you know, we know this, this attack took place um, a few days later. Um, you have got the dugout described and really the things to take from this section here is the kind of cramped feeling of it, the uncomfortable feeling of it, the idea that life has to be very kind of practical and very um, sort of no nonsense about it. You know, the bed doubles as um seating as it were so you've got this bit here where is it um it serves the double purpose of a bed and a seat for the table um it's all kind of showing there's not a lot of space there's not a lot of facilities it's not particularly comfortable probably using the word claustrophobic um you've got the idea that it should be gloomy there's kind of wire covered bed um there's no furniture, save the bottles holding the candles. So that doubling up of, you know, they're using empty bottles as candle holders. They've got their little bit of entertainment in terms of this is a very, I guess, masculine environment. You don't have any women present um, in the play and, and in the whole environment of the trenches and the battlefield. There is mention later on in the play of the women when Hibbert is talking about, you know, his cards and his his exploits with women. But largely the impression of women are people back home to be valued, cherished, look forward to seeing again or um, almost kind of things that are aesthetic, things that are pretty or, or kind of sexual commodities. And here it is more the kind of using the, the pictures of the women to try and make this a little bit more um appealing to try and remember, if you like, the, the lives that they've left behind. You can also argue that, you know, if you're looking at the earth walls deaden the sounds of war, there's still damp air, etc. This idea of, you know, they're underground and it, it may even predict the kind of, you know, the, the deaths of them in the um, subsequent attack, because it really it is like being in a living grave. OK, so you've, you've got that kind of symbolism as well. Just put this little note down here. Um, there's, there's a technique called chiaroscuro, which is a technical term for when light and dark contrast. You see it a lot in paintings. OK, and there's some argument that says that, you know, there's, there's this contrast between the light and the darkness here, the candles and the kind of, you know, corners and everything of this dugout. So it's kind of really showing the kind of gloom, the stillness, the kind of ominous nature of, of everything. And then finally you get, I've just put this little idea of the unities. I don't know if you know about the unities in drama, but um, the theory of the unities from, from classical dramatic theory says that a play should take place in real time, that it should only have one setting and it should only have one plot. So you kind of end up with unity, kind of togetherness of plot, setting and time. 
And here, you know, we're, we're pretty much observing the unities. We are following the action through very closely um, in terms of time. We don't move out of the dugout and we are interested in, you know, just what's happening within the dugout as the German um, attack becomes more and more imminent. So just making sure really that you've got those points annotated on your text or that you've got the notes set to one side so you can talk about how Sheriff uses setting and historical context within the play. OK, then we move through to Act 1 and again you have this kind of scene setting idea. So we know it's the evening of a March day. A pale glimmer of moonlight shines down the narrow steps into one corner of the dugout. So it's it's night. We've got the idea of it being a March day. You can comment on that insofar as March would normally be associated with spring. It would normally have the connotations of new life and hope and a new beginning. Whereas this is obviously the opposite of that. So Sheriff is convert, uh, subverting those expectations um, of March. You have the kind of light, you know, you've got moonlight, candlelight and starlit sky. All of these things really would be kind of very peaceful and very almost romantic in a different context. But here it's it's kind of serving to highlight the unnatural events that are taking place within this conflict. Set against that, you've got uh, that natural kind of surrounding. You've got the kind of mess and the detritus. Okay, detritus is, is kind of random rubbish, okay, of the men's existence. It's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a mess. We've had it emphasised in the previous kind of scene setting stage directions that the sounds of war are faint and far away, even though the, you know, the, the front line is only 50 yards away. So there's this sort of sense of unreality, but also constant sense of threat. You know, the war is, um, and the evidence of the war is always there, but they are trying to distract themselves. They're trying to move away from it slightly okay so we've got um this idea of the the kind of jumbled mass from a nail in the wall so the kind of equipment the idea of the day-to-day -day reality of life on the front line and you should make a note of the technical term exposition okay so the exposition is how a writer of any text kind of sets the scene establishes the characters establishes the themes so here, Sheriff, during the exposition, has chosen to introduce Captain Hardy, first of all. And you can see that he is a cheerful looking man. He is, he's kind of almost um, encapsulating, almost embodying the kind of futility of what they're doing, because he's trying to dry what we assume is a really wet sock over a candle flame. You know, these these soldiers are living in mud. They're absolutely kind of you know, soaking wet, uncomfortable, um, muddy, rat infested so much of the time. And yet he's taking time, you know, to try and dry one sock over a candle. It also shows the day to day life that they're leading is not one of kind of huge excitement. You know, who's got time to dry their sock over a candle? Well, he's just sitting around doing nothing otherwise. Um, that's an idea that's going to come into play later on here with the earwig as well. And he's half singing, half humming this kind of song to pass the time. And we have the lyrics at this point becoming more significant. Tick tock, wind up the clock and we'll start the day over again. Um, again, it kind of encapsulates the futility and the waiting if I'm using the word encapsulates, that means kind of, you know, absolutely embodies, bundles together, represents, signifies, symbolises, puts in a capsule, okay, encapsulates. It kind of really shows it um, because that's all he's doing. He's got time to dry a sock. He's trying to pass the time singing. It's, it's kind of not a glamorous life and most of the time is spent waiting and the time that's not spent waiting is time of extreme danger. And we get then the introduction of Osborne. 
Okay, so the idea of the man's legs coming down, you know, shows you that they're having to climb down into the trenches, emphasises the, the kind of, I guess, the unnatural and cramped position they're all in. And Hardy acts as a little bit of a foil to Osborne at this point. Okay, a character acts as a foil if their characteristics are generally opposite another kind of usually more significant characters. So you can appreciate more about how sensible and mature and responsible Osborne is because Hardy is generally a little bit reckless, a little bit kind of, um, you know, disorganised, lazy, not caring, not doing the best job he can, um, shows exactly how, how good Osborne is at everything. So here... I'd make sure you've got notes of the word exposition, that you've picked up some of these phrases like encapsulates that you can use, you know, futility, foil, detritus. Okay. And then we have this duologue. And that means um, speaking roles for two actors. So think about duo, um, log to do with speech. Um, between Hardy and Osborne. And again, it's it's one that's expository. Um, it is, is setting out information about the exposition. And so often in this play, you have this kind of effect where politeness, etiquette, manners, okay, so kind of the right way of doing things is etiquette, becomes a kind of parody, like a mimicry, an impression of what they were doing in the real world to try and kind of keep up standards, to distract them, to kind of keep things going. So, you know, if you imagine somebody coming into your house and going, oh, splendid to see you, you know, have a drink, do this, offering hospitality. Um, it, it really does kind of show that they have translated their everyday existence into everyday existence in the trenches. You have the kind of factual and, and humorous reference to the water. The implication here is that you know, don't have too much water because the water's too strong. Now, we all know that water shouldn't have any flavour or taste at all, but it's revealed that there's some sort of disinfectant in it to try and kill all the bacteria that would otherwise be making the soldiers ill. And so we kind of have this exchange where, you know, they are um, referring to the kind of sock. It's all very good natured. And then Hardy reveals that actually, you know, there are these minis that are coming over, things like pineapples, um, you know, attacking. And this is, again, starting to give you some information about what life in the trenches is like. OK, so you have this almost kind of um, unsentimental, unemotional, unsentimental, mental account of the devastation that these weapons are causing because you know if you were living under constant threat of a fatal attack you might be a little bit more um kind of serious about it or a little bit more kind of concerned about it than just swish 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 bang they simply blew us to bits yesterday right but again it's it's the soldiers have become acclimatized to um, this kind of unnatural way of life. You can you can look at the fact that they, you know, they give things nicknames, they give things um, kind of bits of jargon. The comparison of, of the weapons to fruit is a little bit sort of light-hearted, but it's also kind of going back to a familiar, um, you know, English, I guess, setting. You know, we can look at these and, and it makes sense. We know what we're talking about. Um, they use understatement a lot to kind of try and stop things being such a big deal, to try and stop things being the awful experience that they would otherwise have to be acknowledged to be. And we get this information here that, you know, the big German attacks expected any day now. And that's that reference to Operation Michael that the, it was suspected the Germans were, were planning. You will also get a little bit of an idea about the way they kind of live their lives and the way things are ordered. You know, there's a kind of communication issues there. You know, you can hear what's going on in the on the um, other side's front line. You can hear the fact that they are basically kind of stocking up, if you like. 
And then looking up, it's all leading to this sense of tension. It's coming up pretty soon. And considering this is such a major attack, a major offensive, the men who are expected to fight it or the men who are living kind of the experience don't really have any um, concrete information filtered down to them about what's happening. And again, that says something about, you know, the kind of um, life in the trenches and, and communication during the war. And it creates tension because nobody really knows what's going to happen. They're completely at the mercy of the orders that they're being given. And the kind of commanders are under no obligation to provide the reason for those orders. They just do what they're told. We kind of also learn that there's a, a kind of lack of personnel, a lack of men. As Hardy says, you know, you can do this with the with the men if you've got five men. So, you know, the idea that they are not sufficiently kind of catered for. We also here get a reference to the idea of people getting out of their duty, getting out of their obligations, the idea of you know military service and what it means to serve. And it's kind of foreshadows the um, issue with Hibbert and his neuralgia later on, because Hardy talks about, you know, his last officer who got lumbago, who had kind of had a medical problem, pain in the back and everything, first night went home. Um, and the kind of humour or sarcasm that's there, you know, he spent one night in the trenches. Now he's got a job um, lecturing young officers on what it's like, you know, to live on the front line when really his experience is, is 24 hours. You also then get a glimpse in terms of the really kind of hideous conditions here where it's saying, you know, you mustn't let your legs hang too low or the rats nor your boots the idea that that is factually kind of conveyed of a, as advice. And Osborne isn't at all horrified by it. He just wants to know how many rats there are, right? So it's kind of taken for granted that, yes, there are going to be rats there. The two million, you know, is, is, is kind of a half joke. But, you know, when you start to combine that with the idea that, you know, they've got all of these different boots, so 25 right leg and nine left, leg boots because obviously kind of um uh, osborne does the maths in terms of the number of boots well that's 17 pairs and hardy puts forward this idea no 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 it's 25 right leg and nine left leg so the idea there is i i suppose that actually they have been taking boots off the corpses to try and kind of save supplies and make things go further and people haven't been getting blown up symmetrically i suppose so it's that kind of a, a reference, that allusion to the kind of, you know, brutal facts of living there. Um, that combined with the rats kind of gives you a glimpse or gives you that insight into the awful side of life because the rats are there doing so well because of the amount of carrion that the rats have got to eat, the amount of kind of meat that the rats have got to feed on being all of the dead soldiers. We also get at the top of this page just the reference to, to Osborne. Um, Hardy's comment as, you know, he's a fussy old man, establishes him as detailed and practical. I'd, I'd kind of look at developing your character notes for Osborne. Make sure you've got a note from the first description of him that he's, you know, tall, thin, fine head, close cropped, iron grey hair, physically as hard as nails. You know, he's, he's strong, practical, resilient, um, and actually has got an attention to detail that is, is, you know, should serve him well. We learn later that he's a he's a schoolmaster. So, you know, that that kind of attention to detail. The conversation then turns to talk about Stanhope and the, it provides some key quotations for understanding the character of Stanhope. So I'd make sure that you are transferring these into any quotation bank that you've got started um, about that character. So Osborne says, I expect Stanhope would like to see you before you go. And Hardy's comment about how is the dear young boy drinking like a fish as usual? There are two things about that. There's the um, information and the assumption that he's drinking and drinking heavily, that he's known for heavy alcohol use. 
and also the idea that Hardy calls him the dear young boy. So that juxtaposition of his apparent youthfulness and also his his hard drinking. Now, we come to realise during the course of the play that Stanhope's drinking is a coping mechanism, that he is trying to deal with the horrors of what he's seeing and experiencing by trying to numb those feelings with alcohol. And he said that, you know, it's the natural thing to ask about Stanhope. He is definitely known for it. Um, and again, just to contrast that idea, you know, he's been referred to as the dear young boy and now he's talked about as the um, poor old man. So you've got that sense of premature, so too early, premature ageing of Stanhope, that his experiences out in the war have, have made him old before his time. He is only a young man, but um, he, is, he is pitied. You know, his age belies his experience. And then again, another Osborne quotation, quiet, sober, old thing. So Osborne as a character who's going to, you know, quietly observe and is going to be sensible and reasonable and rational and not under the influence of alcohol, that kind of sober meaning both serious and sober meaning, you know, not influenced by drink. And yet we know when Osborne steps in to defend Stanhope, he's a long way the best company commander we've got. So Stanhope is being introduced as a positive character, albeit one who is flawed. OK, so he has his flaws. Um, OK, when you're then looking at how that idea of um, Stanhope's developed, there's this kind of um, presentation, first of all, of the kind of psychological conflict that's present in all of them. The idea of psychological, mental um, how do you cope? How do you manage to experience such horror and not break down completely? And the idea that Stanhope is being presented as somebody who is both admired and pitied. This whole section of the play talking about the idea that he is a kind of freak show exhibit, the morbid curiosity of seeing him drink that much whiskey. In part, there's the idea of you know, entertainment in the trenches, the idea that life day in, day out is so dull, so kind of um, much a waiting game that any entertainment to relieve the boredom is appreciated. And then also this idea that um, there is this joint and conflicting idea of admiring him and pitying him, that they admire um, his ability as a commander who he is. And, and also in this strange construct of masculinity, they also admire his ability to drink that much and to remain standing and speaking. But at the same time, there is a, that element of being pleased that they are not him. Um, that element of kind of schadenfreude. Um, I don't know if you know that term, just putting it there. It's a German term, ironically, that means pleasure in another's misery. So they are using his kind of misfortune and his approach to kind of derive some sort of satisfaction about their own lives. You know, this idea at the bottom that, you know, it rather reminds you of bear baiting or cockfighting to sit and watch a boy drink himself unconscious. The idea that, you know, these men are deriving entertainment from a kind of idea of violence, even if it's violence to the self, and um, that it's a waste of a, of a life and a waste of Stanhope's potential. And Hardy kind of confesses as much, said, you know, we need something to liven people up. Um, they then have a conversation about Stanhope's last leave, and it gives you an idea of the kind of, again, the conflict that's present within Stanhope, the idea that he doesn't want to be seen as he now is by the people at home because he's been changed and damaged and, and kind of lessened by his experience and by his addiction. And so therefore he chooses to go and spend his leave in Paris, presumably having a wild time, rather than going home to his, his father, who's a vicar. Um, you also get a little bit more insight into Stanhope's character and what is admired or what the consequences of that behaviour are. So he's never had a rest. 
you know, the other men come out and go home again. Il, Il, young Stanhope goes on sticking it month in, month out. So the idea is he cares. The idea is maybe he has nothing else to do. Um, he's dedicated to his job. You know, he's he's got some sort of kind of, I don't know, idea of punishing himself or whatever. But he's he's always there. And then we get this anecdote by Hardy just saying that actually the idea that he's drinking and his behaviour has become volatile. So if you are volatile, you are kind of less stable. You are more likely to be kind of emotionally up and down about things. And that Stanhope had lost control of himself. It foreshadows the conversation later on in the play um, or the argument with Hibbert in Act 3. And Osborne is surprised, sorry, Hardy is surprised that Osborne is aware of it and that he's aware of it from Stanhope himself. So Stanhope has clearly felt the need to talk, to confide, to kind of unburden himself to Osborne, who, you know, you can then view as something of a paternal um, figure, almost a kind of priest-like confessor, if you like. Whereas Hardy's idea, we tried to hush it up, shows that there's something kind of humiliating or embarrassing, he feels, about the fact he lost control of himself and cried. So that kind of repression and shying away from emotion, again, all going to the idea of what, what is it to be um, a man? What is it to be masculine within this environment? And again, we I look through, you can pick out quotations about Osborne that kind of um, emphasise the points we've already made. And Osborne is quick to defend Stanhope and say exactly, you know, um, how good he is, how reliable he is, how strong he is, um, and how loyal Osborne is to him. And Hardy, like so many times in the play, if there's strong emotion or, or so, it's shied away from and, and kind of humour is used to deflect it. So, you know, you sweet, sentimental old darling. And looking at this final page of what we're going to say is this part, um, it's then the symbol of the earwig. And the earwig's quite useful because you can say that it represents the men. It acts as a metaphor for the men because this poor little earwig is spending its time in the trenches running round and round pointlessly without any idea what it's doing. And it's kind of when the men are having the earwig races, is kind of being manipulated by higher authority in the in the army ironically when hardy says you know get the best pace out of an earwig dip it in whiskey that is exactly what stanhope seems to be doing to himself but the earwig becomes a symbol of the waiting the futility the helplessness of the men um and how open they are to manipulation and actually how insignificant and ultimately disposable they sadly are um to the to the command in the british army I hope that's been useful. Um, I will be doing kind of the rest of the play bit by bit. Okay, bye now.